but there's been one figure outstanding on this series, which I don't think you need me to say who, and uh, it's Ian, Ian Botham, we know him the man It was the summer of summers for England, not matched, in my view, since the 1960-61 Tide Test Series in Australia, and before that, 1936-37, when the Australians, 2-0 down after two matches, won the final three tests and the series. Then one man, Bradman, was more responsible than anyone else for the victory, and this year, 1981, one man, Ian Botham, made it all possible for England. There were many other contributions, marvellous ones too, from the rest of the England team. But uh, holding centre stage, for better or worse, throughout the summer, was Ian Botham. When Australia were poised to go 2-0 in the series, he made at Headingley a century that was sometimes lucky and always very, very spectacular. Edgbaston and Old Trafford, with his marvellous bowling and another brilliant century, were just as spectacular. But there wasn't an ounce of luck in either of those matches. The whole series became a marvellous fairy tale for England's sports followers. It wasn't just cricket fans who were cheering both of them along. Sports fans, and even those little interested in sport, were swept away on a wave of national delight. Ian Botham was a hero. Well, short memories, eh? Well, perhaps they are. Because if you think about it, it was only 11 days after Lords that Headingley took place. And uh, if you have a look back at Lords, I don't know that we really would have expected a hero to have been accorded a reception of this kind as he walked back to the pavilion. Returns to silence. Was that uh, your lowest point of the year, Ian? Certainly a point I don't uh, want to remember, uh, or try not to remember too much. Um, yeah, it's, I had mixed views. I, I'd, made, I'd premeditated that I was going to, if it was out there, to have a go at the lap. Um, well, I was really interested in just quick runs, and I wasn't, a pair didn't really bother me. And uh, that's what I got. How long was the walk back? Uh, it got longer and longer. It seemed to be taking two steps forward and one back all the time. You, you rate yourself as being super optimistic. What were your feelings between then and the time you got to Headingley? Well, a lot of things happened near the when I decided to give the captaincy out resignation, and I felt that um, it was a new page, now a new chapter, and let's see if we can um, write it in uh, a more acceptable way for myself and just take the game as it came. Because all I could do was hope that at Headingley, and I didn't even know if I was going to be selected for Headingley, well. and when I was selected, I thought, well, I'll just go out there and play. And he's gone, and Ian Botham has done it. Third ball. And the old magic returns. With a bit of help, I think one must say, from the pitch, because it did appear to keep rather low. But what a start. And what a morale booster for Botham and, indeed, for Brearley and for England as well. Oh, he could be out, Botham underneath, he's caught it, and that's the end of Kim Hughes' innings. A leading edge, he was looking to turn it on the onside somewhere wide of mid on, and Botham swinging it, as indeed he has all day, and at last, England getting a ball to go to hand, and not only that, but catching it, and he could hardly have got it. Not far away. He didn't go all that far forward, I don't think. And Botham once again swinging that ball into the left-hander. He was beaten by the swing. <laughs> Must be gone. Botham is struck again. 58 to Yallop. Australia now 357 for seven. Botham gets his first five-wicket haul since the game before he took over as captain. 
and uh, that was the game too in which Bob Taylor, 40 years old today, broke the world record for test victims. Him. Both of them picks up another one. Marsh gone for 28. Australia 401 for 9. Ian Botham, 6 for 95, 39.2 overs and 11 maidens. He was the star of the show. Safely away for four. Good shot. It was in the air for about 20 yards, but he hit it very firmly away past Trevor Chappell's left hand. silly just to try and pick the right ball yep, same treatment super shot that little loosener from uh, Alderman twenty one to both of them Vicious, that one. Almost unplayable. And I think Rodney Marsh might even agree. Good shot, that. Picked that up beautifully. Way past square leg. 35 to both of them now. That's exactly what he wants to do. And the 44 for six, and Botham has streaked away to 46. And there it is, 53 in Botham. A really fine innings in the circumstances by any standards but a wonderful sight to see him hitting the ball with the same old freedom and it really looks as though the shackles have dropped from his shoulders since the burden of uh, captaincy has been lifted from him and that is I think I might be saying his first 50 since his first innings as captain at Trent Bridge last year 46 now by the far one And he's gone. Very fine delivery indeed. Both of them in that over. Just losing concentration. And Rodney Marsh appropriately breaks the world wicket keeping test record off the bowling of Dennis Lilly, who must surely have given him more victims than any other bowler. Despite uh, both them's splendid innings, England failed to save the follow on by just uh, 28 runs. And quite rightly, Kim Hughes asked them to go in again. That's the situation at the start. England needed 221 runs to avoid an innings defeat. Graham Gooch, the man out, caught on Saturday evening by Alderman off Lilly without scoring. Boycott, naught not out, and Brearley, four not out, six for one. Very well timed stroke. And four runs. Lily again from the Caxtell Lane end. That's a good shot. Long chase back for Hughes, but it's going to be a vain one. And Mike Braley has been very precise on anything slightly over pitch so far this morning yes easy as you like thank you very much to Terry Alderman at third slip and the first victim of the morning for Dennis Lilly and an excellent delivery this 
pitched on the off stump. He had to play at it, and it just left him off the seam. Safely away for four. and throwing there from Trevor Chappell and a fine shot from David Gower. That was very well bowled, but my word, it did cut a long way off the seam. Alan Border safely took it there at slip. I reckon that must have pitched around about middle and leg and finished up outside off stump. Now David Gower has gone for nine, 37 for three now. Excellent piece of bowling from Terry Alderman. But I'm not too sure there's very much Gower could have done about that. That's close, yes. I'm afraid he has to go LBW again. Second time in the match, Mike Gatting, and Alderman has struck again. He removed Gower. Now he's taken Gatting, and England 41 for four. Mark, but for one instant, he must have wondered where it was going. And showing that he can attack as well when the opportunity arises. It won't go for four. Chapel catching up with it just inside the long off boundary. Safely away for four. Very similar to the stroke with which Willie got off the mark when he was facing Terry Alderman. Shot. That's gone like a rocket. <laughs> Great shot. This pair doing the right thing by their skipper, Mike Brealey, who's there with Rodney Hogg. So, in the air, that one, but still a beautiful stroke from Peter Willey to bring up the 100 for England. 102 for four now, and Willey has gone to 31. Beautifully placed. Now that is really good thinking. A superb piece of captaincy, a magnificent piece of bowling, and Peter Willey is gone. That's one of the best pieces of tactical thinking I've seen in a long time. Very, very good piece of out cricket by Australia. There it is. Mind you, the delivery was tremendous because it climbed that little bit higher and, and got Peter Willey a little bit tucked up and he really only chipped it rather than hit it to that short third man. But very, very fine performance by the Australian side there. And what a nice way for Dennis Lilly 
to become the greatest ever wicket taker in the history of Anglo-Australian tests. Goes past uh, Huey Trumbull's record of 141. Yeah, what a triumph for him it would be if he could still be batting at six o'clock this evening. Lovely shot. Alderman pitching up again, inviting him to drive, and Ian Botham needs no second invitation. Beautifully timed, it was backward a square, but it's four runs nonetheless. And that's taking a long time to go down. And he's gone, and a very reluctant lever of the crease. Alderman getting the vital breakthrough for Australia when it seemed that Boycott just simply couldn't be penetrated. And he does not look very happy with that, but that's partly, I'm sure, because he's not put a foot wrong. And really never looked like missing the ball at all. But he is out, LBW, for 46 after 215 minutes of superb defence. Bob Taylor off the mark. Oh, and a rather soft dismissal, but very well bowled. The man placed there for it, and Ray Bright making no mistake, a simple catch. Lifting a bit, and Bob Taylor sometimes inclined to pop the ball up in that area. Becomes the seventh man out, and Alderman's fourth victim rather disappointed with himself. Four runs. Four. It's a good shot too. Smashed away to the left hand of cover. Oh, well stopped. It's a great piece. <laughs> well, that's bad luck. Bad luck. It was a lovely shot. And a superb piece of feeling to get to it. One runs still needed to avoid an innings defeat, and even though Botham and Dilly were going so well, only three wickets in hand. And oh, what a splendid shot! Very wide, very well pitched up, and Graham Dilly continuing his successful policy before tea. Splendid shot, and that brings up the 50 partnership. Oh, 
beautiful stroke. Beautiful stroke. No trouble at all, another tremendous blow through the covers. And round the wicket or over the wicket, they're coming all alike to Graham Dilley at the moment, and that now is his highest test score for England. 39 not out. Action replay from the last over. And he got uh, 16 in the second innings of that, his first test match at Perth, and batted for a long time in both innings, and particularly in the second innings, in a losing cause not dissimilar to this one. Although in that, on that occasion he, he uh, batted defensively for a long period. So there's no doubt that he has the ability. And he brings up the 200. To a great cheer from this uh, Yorkshire crowd who are relieved to see the home team at least putting up a fight here. And not quite where he intended, but it brings him his 50 nonetheless. His second 50 of the match, and that broad smile. Conveying the old sense of enjoyment. Safe fair over the top of Hughes's head. Bit of a risky blow that, but uh, he's got away with it. I think he hit this one somewhere near the splice. But he's such a powerful man, and he carried Deepish mid on. So just eight needed now to make Australia bat again. in a row and <laughs> the last two owing a bit to luck but uh, he's really having a lovely time and so the crowd good Sunday league shot this overslip four runs all the way thoroughbred stroke. This is what we were saying a little while ago. This is a perfect shot. He stays where he is, he doesn't pull that front leg away, and he hits it right in the middle, and England go into the lead. deal of thought as you would expect into his field placings here and there is the hundred partnership between Ian Botham and Graham Dilley in just 70 minutes which of if they haven't turned the match upside down, they've certainly turned the character of the match upside down.
really been a splendid innings. always on the cards once Alderman decided that would uh, be his angle of attack. Complete change of angle there. He was always likely to non-plus the left hand out. But what a splendid knock that was from Graham Dilley. 56. Bold Alderman. And that gives uh, Alderman his fifth wicket. chasing it it's going straight into the confectionery stall and out again a beautiful hit but a wonderful follow through by Ian Botham 50 in the first innings a century in the second and six wickets a marvellous all-round performance to match some of the others he's produced for England and a marvellous tribute as well from his teammates all of whom have gathered and Mike really is just giving him the word to stick around Safe and four. Unorthodox but valuable. And up comes the 300 now. And he's through. highest test score. Oh, magnificent stroke. Four more runs. Lawson getting tired. These runs are picking up on the scoreboard. 123 ahead, England. Last ball of the day, and the new ball will be due tomorrow. And he's got the single he wanted. So he'll have the strike in the morning. This man who has become, once again, a national hero. That was a great performance, but you did need a bit of help from three fellows there, Graham Dilley and Chris Old, and uh, Bob Willis coming in at number 11. Yeah, I was just, just looking at the end of that tape, um, running the last ball there with Bob. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but he hesitates halfway down the wicket. Huh. And that's for us saying, go, 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 which was a, not the best of calls under the <laughs> circumstances. And Bob uh, later on said to me, so I wasn't sure if you were saying go or no. And we got the big shuffle. I think if the field had picked it up, we could have struggled. But obviously, yes, they, they made a great... Um, Graham Dilley played absolutely magnificently. When he came to the wicket, I just said, to, he said, what are we doing? I said, well, look, let's just enjoy ourselves and give it a whack and see what happens. Because he can strike the ball as well as anybody, as he showed. You know, and he hit the Indeed ball very, did. very hard. Well, 3.56 all out. And Australia, just 130 to win. That's almost nothing on uh, any sort of a test match pitch. First wicket to go down, Graham Wood. Well, I don't 
don't think Wood uh, is very keen on that, and uh, I suspect from uh, the way he's looking at it, he thought he might have squeezed it into the ground. Both of them shouted, and uh, we'll just have to look and see what happened with the wicketkeeper and the slips. 13 for one, Court Taylor bowled both of them, Wood out for 10. How was the super optimist then? Um, well, we said, we said before we went out that um, it was one of these wickets where we felt that if you got one wicket, you could easily get three or four. And if I remember rightly, we did. We got two very quick wickets. We got Kim Hughes and Graham Yallop very quickly just before lunch. And suddenly the whole format of the game changed around. And suddenly the, you know, there was a lot more pressure on them. And the wicket wasn't, um, I don't think you could call it a test standard wicket. And um, I think that showed with the, the ball that got Trevor Chappell out that got very big and, very, and went very quickly as well. Kim Hughes has bounced, Yallops. There was a, quite a, you know, a Bob bowl magnificently. He, well, I think the Australians christened him after that bustling Bob when he steamed in, but he, he bowled magnificently. But he exploited what there was in the wicket. And by bowling that length, I think that's why he got the results. He bowled very, very well. OK, 74 to win. And uh, here is Bob Willis coming in from the Kirkstall Lane end. He's been switched from the football ground end by Mike Brealey. Steaming in now, and he's bowling to Trevor Chapman. <laughs> It really was a difficult delivery. He's gone, and there's not much that could be done about that. Trevor Chappell really had no chance. Very good piece of bowling from Bob Willis. The second wicket goes down at 56. Trevor Chappell caught Taylor Bowl Willis for eight, and Dyson is 29, not out. Bold and well played. very well. A good over from Bob Willis. Well, very, very similar to the ball that got Greg Chappell out, perhaps a fraction more offside, and Hughes did very well to handle that one. Oh, what a good catch. Everything is running for both of them. Runs, wickets and catches. And the Australian captain goes for naught. Caught both them, bowled Willis. Hughes has gone. And it's 58 for three. Oh, good catch. Super catch that. Marvellous reflex action there. Yallop has gone without scoring. 58 for four with Dyson 29 not out. What a marvellous catch and what a great session for England. Oh, good shot. Four runs. Heartening stroke for Australia. wicket too, Alan Border, such a stalwart of this Australian batting side, 65 for 5, 65 needed, 5 wickets to fall. He's got a touch on it, he's gone. Going for the hook which he played so well in the previous over. But Bob Willis is extra pace. Getting him a look at that uh, look of suppressed excitement on Mike Brayley and other England fielders. Willis is fourth wicket. Played and off the mark too for Ray Bright. to six to win, Willis to Marsh. In the air, Dilly is underneath it. And he's caught it! A 
very, very good catch indeed in the circumstances. He didn't have much room to play with, another foot and he would have been over the boundary. Willis has taken his fifth wicket. Sooner or later, Rodney Marsh had to go for the big hit. And England are holding their catches just at the time when they need to. 74 for seven, Australia. Twenty-four at the moment. Yes, he's got a touch and he's gone. Willis has taken his sixth wicket. Lawson out for one. And England on the brink of an absolutely sensational victory, which uh, is going to go down as one of the most amazing test victories of all time if it happens. before this time yesterday, English cricket was being buried. Oh, and that's very effective indeed, four runs. That is, he's a most canny cricketer, Dennis Lilly. That was extremely clever thinking on his part. Quite deliberate, uppercut. Astonishing shot. <laughs> Definitely gave it a lift. The tactics on both sides are right. That uh, these two have got to play as many strokes as they can, and England must keep the ball just as they can't quite drive. Oh, that's a good shot. That was very well picked up by Bright. It didn't get up all that much. And Chris Old dragging this one down a little. Ray right onto it like a shot. Didn't quite get that, I don't think. But he got it uh, well enough to bang it into the fence. It's square. And again, I don't think it was all that bad a ball. It seemed to me to be picked up off around middle stump. Up comes the 100 for Australia. 100 for 8, 17. Now to Bright, and nine to Lily, 30 to win. Well, that's a good shot. It just couldn't have been placed better by Dennis Lilly. You wouldn't believe that the ball could get between Chris Old and Graham Dilly down there on the boundary. Lilly is 17, Bright 19. Ten for nine, and the first one Willis got up into Lily's half, produced the wicket. Lily out for 17, caught Gatting, bowled Willis. He's got him. Oh no, he's put him down. To solve. Third slip. Certainly a pit to carry this one. And Chris seemed to be, have it absolutely under control. And I think that carried as well. It's just as well as not Keith Fletcher. It's all over. 
and it is one of the most fantastic victories ever known in test cricket history. Bob Willis, eight wickets, a fabulous performance. England have won this match after one of the most astonishing fightbacks you could ever see. And what a remarkable scorecard that is. 111, England regard that as the devil's number. Well, there was no devil's number about it today. Australia beaten and England winning by 18 runs. And the men who made it all possible for England, a really sensational performance this. 15.1 overs, three maidens, eight for 43. It's his best ever test match performance, Bob Willis and I don't think I've ever seen him bowl better. He bowled like a man inspired out there today. It was almost as though he was in another world. And an all-round performance, which I think is one of the best I've ever seen in Test cricket. In my opinion, a, a, a captain's performance that came one match too late, Ian Bowden. take you back now from the uh, palmy days of Headingley to something that's not, not quite so pleasant. Losing the first test match of a series against the Australians. How did that feel? Um, I felt as it's a peculiar test match because I felt if we'd caught our catches, we'd have won the test match um, on reflection, but uh, we didn't and we lost. And I don't know, is it... It was a testament, a very peculiar testament. So I still felt we could win it on the last day. Well, let's just have a look now and see what you said to Peter West right at the very end of that last day after you'd gone down to Kim Hughes' side. How do you react to being made captain one at a time? It's a bit like being on the gallows, isn't it, in the big drop? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm not... I'm not uh, it doesn't particularly worry me. Um, I think uh, my family feel the pressure a little bit more than I do, uh, one at a time, but... Uh, I think I'm improving all the time as a captain, and uh, I th I'm think I'm hopefully things are starting to go I'm starting to get into more order with the bat, and uh, the bowling I'm quite happy with. So uh, hopefully, if I come into a little bit more form, then uh, that'll shut my critics up. So looking forward to Lords, you take an optimistic outlook. Oh, very much so. Yes, I, I, I've said all along I think this series is going to be very close, and I think it's one that the public are, are going to enjoy very, very much. In that interview there with Peter West. You look very, very happy, but what a contrast with the one we're going to show you now when you talk to him at Lord's. Ian, we gather that you've told the chairman of selectors that you don't feel prepared to carry on as captain on a one-match basis. What was it exactly that you said to him? What I've just said to the chairman um, is that I feel um, that it's unfair on myself and on the team to continue on a one-match basis because... Um, I don't, I don't know what's happening and the team doesn't know what's happening and I feel that it's certainly started to affect my game a little bit in the sense that I'm, I'm thinking about that at the end, you know, last day of a test match, um, what's going to happen. And I feel that it would be better for me and for the team to know exactly what is going on and um, hopefully we can get on now and win the series. Had you and your colleagues, your fellow selectors, in fact, made up your minds earlier in the afternoon that you were going to make a change in the captain anyway? Yes, we, we had made up our minds and... Uh... The, for the main reason, we were a bit worried as to Ian's form. We felt that he's improving as a captain, but uh, over these last few months, he's had a rough time. I mean, he, he, West Indies was a really hard tour. He's come back, and his actual form hasn't been too good. And I think that uh, his family has been harassed, everything's been harassed. So, so we felt that uh, it would be a good thing perhaps to, to give him a rest for a few matches, from captaincy, that is, and uh, let him get back into the groove again. Who do you think will be the new captain, then? I don't know. I, I, Who would you choose? I, well, in my view, the bloke, the captain that I feel is the best captain in this country and uh, has been, who I did play a lot of cricket under, and that's Mike Brearley. Well, that was a good choice. Have you ever thought of becoming a national selector? <laughs> no, I'm, I've always admired Mike, and I've always felt that he's... Um, that was by a long way the best captain I've ever played under. Um, I ca it's very hard to explain, but he seems to have this... He seems to bring the best out of everybody around him, and everyone, there's a willing, will, willingness to win, everyone wants to do well for him, and 
I think we also have a great, you know, I certainly have a great deal of respect for him, and I'm sure the other players do as well. That's a tremendous attribute for any captain to have, if, um, if the players feel like that about him. I think that's the most important thing of all. Ian, uh, Mike Brealey won the match at uh, Headingley as skipper, his first time back, but uh, even with all those attributes you listed there, you were still having problems at Edgbaston when we got through to the final innings because the Australians needed only 151 to win on a pitch where I think most people would think that they should have made those runs. Here's the first ball of the Australian second innings. It's Willis steaming in from the city end. I think there's uh, 16,000 odd people here and they all shouted. It's Graham Wood is LBW to Chris Ole, the first wicket down for England. Just two runs on the board and 151 in all needed. And Chris Ole has achieved the breakthrough. Australia 14 for one. That's a good stroke. That's really racing away. Gower's after it. May just catch it, but concedes it. And the first four. Oh, there's a big shot, and that's it. Bob Willis has done it. Dyson is up, LBW, it didn't get up very high, it came back a wee bit off the wicket, and Dyson is out for 13, and the second Australian wicket goes down at 19. And every England player is around Big Bob Willis. And this time, John Dyson doesn't go forward. So he's trying to come back now. And it keeps low, really, that's what did him. Oh, it's a beautiful stroke, but straight down that man's throat. John Embry's done it. A beautiful looking stroke, but he obviously didn't keep it down, and he hit the only man down at deep back of square leg, John Embry, and it was right down his throat, and Kim Hughes is gone. And that's edge and it's dropped. Very low, difficult chance. In fact, I suppose there must be some doubt from our position here whether that carried. Get a better look from the camera at the far end. Very full length. He's edged it. Oh, yes. Just carried near Mike Brearley's right boot at first slip. Uh, that's beaten Gar. Willis is the man out of the boundary. He will cut it off. No, he won't. That's a fine stroke. Beautifully timed and an indication of just how quick that outfield is. 50 up. 52 for three. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. And a uh, glorious shot there through the covers by Alan Border. Over pitch ball, a half volley from Chris Old. And that's going through, four runs. And then no ball put away down to long leg, giving uh, Yallop a free hit there. So he made the most of it. And you see the umpire's signal already out there. So 82 on the board now, the 50 partnership between these two left-handers. Oh, 
And that's going away again, and it's four more, and this is uh, Graham Yallop's answer this time. And remarkably to recount that this is the best partnership of any wicket on either side in the match. That gives Embry a chance to uh, have a spin this time at Graham Yallop. Border has taken most of him over the last few overs. He's gone. Tremendous shout going up there. And Yallop goes. Embry has made the breakthrough. Is it too late? That's the question to be asked. So Yallop goes for 30. Four men out now for 87. Very well deserved wicket for John Embry. You see, Graham Yallop comes down to push him through the onside, gets an inside edge onto his pad, and it dollies up to Ian Botham, fielding very close short on the offside didn't quite time that but the outfield is very quick they are about to cut it off and three more to border and the hundred comes up for Australia 102 for four and that's uh, another little milestone Count those in the dressing room and the pressure's on. Three figures on the board. Fewer than 50 to make. And that's well bowled. Out of a bit of rough stuff there. The border is gone for 40. That's 105 for five, and no one in this match now will make a half century. Quite astonishing. And a very awkward delivery indeed, which, as you can see, bounces, flicks the handle or the glove, and pops up probably off Alan Border's body. There's a start for Rodney Marsh. Chris Old won't catch that. The outfield very quick. And a little touch of sensible aggression there. 109 for five. Shot for four. Too short twice in the last uh, four deliveries, John Embry. Once Rodney Marsh cracked away past point and that one was a very good stroke from Kent. Hold him. 114 for six. Rodney Marsh goes, trying to hit it away through mid on. Across the line. 114 for six. And the crowd has gone noisily berserk. He's out. LBW. First ball and Botham's on a hat trick. First ball, Ray Bright. It looked to me as though it kept a bit low. It also looked to me as though it was absolutely plumb. 114 for seven now. And this is incredible. And in comes Ian Botham. Fires it in. It's a little bit short, but absolutely smacking him. <laughs> and he wasn't far away from it either. down the ground to Jeff Boycott. Second attempt and Bob Taylor grabbed it. 
Lily is gone. It's 120 for eight. And you can see how wide that delivery was. And up she goes, out she goes. And thank goodness for that, says Bob Taylor. Both again to Kent. And he's bowled in, and that surely is going to be it. A joyous, triumphant both of them. Harms aloft again, 121 for nine, and the man that they so much needed to see the back of, Martin Kent. Bowled by both in an inspired spell here. He goes for ten, 121 for nine, with only Terry Alderman to come. And who would believe it? Well, what value this crowd have had today. They've rolled up in their thousands today, and this is what they've been looking forward to see. And Martin Kent whacking that through mid-wicket, pitched just outside the off-stump, went straight through and hit the off-stump. Well, Terry Alderman on his first tour, first major series, tremendous success with the ball, but rather fancy he's got the jitters out there now. Alderman facing. And that's it this time. He's made sure he's taken five wickets. He grabs a stump. And another memorable victory for England. Tremendous performances. Australia finally dismissed on this fourth day of this fourth Cornhill test for 121. 151 they required. And tremendous scenes here at Edgebaston. This crowd who really never thought it was possible, but they came in their thousands hoping for such a result. And this is entirely what they've got. Tremendous performance by the English bowlers, but one must add a lot of fairly inept batting from the Australians here today. My choice, because it really finished the match, both of them... He didn't want to bowl, you know. Didn't he? <laughs> he thought, I think, you know, now he, it's just beginning to come back, the real confidence that he always used to have. He did not say he didn't want to bowl, but he wondered if other people shouldn't bowl ahead of him. And um, he came in, and he, now he's coming in really hard, and it makes all the difference with him if he's coming in hard and hitting the ground, hitting the bat. And I think he did it for a while at Headingley, and he did it again today. It was a marvellous, marvellous flair. Well, from what Mike said there, in that uh, interview, you didn't want to bowl. I read here in your own piece by Ian Botham that you didn't want to bowl. Do you think you would have come on at that precise moment had you been captain instead of Mike? Oh, I suppose probably not. Um, it all changed when uh, John Embry got that wicket. Alan Border. Yeah. yeah. And once, once Alan Border was out, then, then I. F Mike was talking to me prior to that point to uh, whether I should bowl. And I felt that what I would have done was I said the odd ball's turn. I said to Mike, why don't we try Peter Woolley just for an over or two? Just a little bit of variation from that end and see if he gets any response. And then once, um, with John then getting rid of Alan Border in that over, then I, I, I agreed with Mike that I should bowl. But uh, I wasn't too keen. The wicket didn't look like it had that much in it for me, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, it didn't have all that much in it for you because you only picked up five for one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I could have done with a little bit more, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't quite so good for the Australians at uh, Edgbaston, nor was it quite so good for them uh, at Old Trafford, where they were bowled out in some ridiculously small number of overs. But let's take you on now to Old Trafford, to where you came out in the second innings, and it was 104 for five. At lead of 101, so in effect, it's 205 for five, and you came out uh, to a standing ovation. Shades of Lords on the last day. <laughs> well, he's got two men back, a deep square and a deep long leg for Ian Botham, his first ball. And he's worked that away, he's off the dreaded pair, and that uh, will no doubt bring a huge sigh of relief, and I'm quite sure a big grin. There it is. Chris Tavery needing one for his 50, facing Mike Whitney. 
and he's got it with a short single to mid-wicket. So Tavry's patient, enduring effort brings in his second 50 of the match. My word, it's been hard work, but uh, five England wickets have gone down, four of them since he's come in, and he's still there. Right again to Botham. And that's a good shot, and that's going to be Botham's first four, the first four for England since lunch, and only the second of the day. And really, this match is crying out now for some of the belligerence that Ian Botham showed at Heading. into both of them. Oh, and that is off the inside edge, extremely lucky, going for a big shot through the covers. And a very thin inside edge, Marsh having no chance of cutting it off with his left hand. Through the gap, well on the chaser. Be there to Tepperay. Whitney now to Botham. Botham's on 21. Four oh, goes to 25. They just mustn't give this fellow room to play outside the off stump. It doesn't appear as though they've uh, picked up anything from their Headingley experience. Anything that gives him room outside the off stump, he just thrashes. And really, it's uh, West Indian style. Hit it on the up. He doesn't get very close to it, but he hits it on the up and very, very solidly indeed. Them and the crowd is now animated, they were very quiet early on, and so was the batting. <laughs> and up comes the 150 for England. In both of them goes to 28, Tavare 59. So David Constant has taken the second new ball from Ken Palmer and walks back up to the Warwick Road end. Terry Alderman comes back on. Out comes the ball out of the cellophane. And that second new ball being taken instantly by Kim Hughes. Outside the off stump. for Whitney to have to take. He's put it down. But what a steepener, what a terrible moment for a lad playing in his first test match. 
It was miscued and it went so high. He thought he had it. And then hesitated and had to make ground for it once again. Dennis Lilly. In the air and six. That was a good hit because he was beaten for pace with it and he took his eye off it and still swung the bat and collected it over deep square leg. In the air. And again. He's beaten Whitney and Wood away there at deep square. No hooking down there, safely into the ground. But once again, smashed behind square. And another bouncer here. And this time, Ian looks at it. And he hits it right in the middle. And that goes for six. His second six of the over. And it takes him on to 48. Just not learning at all, the Australian bowlers. At Headingley, they gave both of them room to play his strokes. Here, they're doing it again, and he smashed them for a quick 50. 60 balls it's taken him, two sixes and six fours. And it's delighted this capacity crowd here at Old Trafford. Good shot. Well, Dennis was very lucky there that uh, he was on the way down with his head as the ball went past. So Botham has gone ahead of Tavare now. 65 to number six and 63 to number three. And uh, that drew Alderman into the trap first one up to be driven down the ground now that was just about the best shot both of played today good shot and amongst all the blazing hitting Cabaret is producing an occasional gem and in the background, the crowd rises for the three-figure partnership. In the air for six. He plays that shot very well. It doesn't bother looking at it. It just swats it away like a, well, as though you're smashing a fly. And this is another astonishing shot. Just watch Ian Botham's head. He's not looking. But he still swipes it for six. Dropped him. I'd say that he got the hands to that. But I uh, rather imagine from about middle, middle and off. Not quite middle, but uh, it takes both them on now to 96. And brings a look of disgust there from Bella Bright. Yes, certainly pitched outside the off stump there, but Ian Botham somehow got it down to fine leg for two good runs. didn't uh, Lily's there it's cleared him over the ropes what a magnificent way to go to a six what a superlative exhibition this has been a 
and the whole of Old Trafford rising to its feet to acclaim yet another memorable, magnificent performance from Ian Wilkin. Down the wicket, big hit, glorious shot, all the way. Up go the arms, six more for both of them. And that six times he's cleared the boundary in his total of 109. <laughs> Little bit of lift there and he's gone, caught behind, and the end of a truly memorable, magnificent performance by Ian Botham. 118, young Mike Whitney takes his wicket. It's another very simple catch, in fact, this time to Rod Marsh. But the whole of Old Trafford, you can be sure, will be on their feet. And they're going to applaud him all the way in, a reception he so thoroughly deserves. Nothing could have been better for... A a packed Saturday afternoon crowd than to see an exhibition of stroke play such as we've seen from Ian Bolton. And I reckon the Australians will be more pleased to have that view of Ian Botham than any they've had out on the field for the last couple of hours. That's how it all happened. That's Ian Botham's scorecard as put together by Wendy Wimbush, our scorer. And it shows one or two very interesting things. Just have a look at those strokes away on the offside which indicate just how much room the Australian bowlers were giving both them for his strokes. The only strokes he played on the onside were the sixes he hit uh, from the Warwick Road end and the ones he swept away off Raymond Bright. Those are the details of what was a magnificent innings that spanned the T interval. You can see it finished at 4.52 and what a performance it was. Eventually caught Marsh bowled Whitney. He received 102 balls and he scored his century from 86, and that included five sixes and 11 fours, a total of six sixes and 13 fours in the whole of his innings, and I thought it was a better knock than the marvellous innings he played at Headingley. 118 in that total of 253 for six. Still there is Chris Taveray on 69. And he can play a few shots as well. It's not going to go to the boundary. Well, I um, need a bit of rugby passing to Graham Yallop. And he's gone. At last, Australia get Chris Tavery out for 78. And in the end, it was a simple slip catch. The ball lifting very suddenly there, and Tavery, who's played the short ball so well, really unable to keep that down. It was, once he got behind it, more or less unplayable. Well fielded by Dyson of third man, but that brings up the 300 for England. Crowd enjoying this. Plenty of variety for them today. And that's beautiful strike. That you really meddle there, not it bounced back off the advertising board in front of the pavilion. He's always been a great sweeper, Tom. Yes, and uh, Alan sweeps on length, not direction. If the length's right, you can sweep the ball. Super shot. Oh, and now he's really, this is the impish not of old. And like both them before him, he's a difficult man to bowl, bowl to when he's in this mood because he can invent strokes. to Alan Knott and that's a real good hand from Notty
Be two there. And uh, big applause for the 50 partnership. Very, very useful partnership, this for England. Exactly what was required. Good shot, and uh, that's four runs. That's fine blow from uh, Embry. Goes to 33. Uh, a really good shot from uh, what was a rather loose delivery. This is a textbook back foot shot by John Embry, and he hits the ball very crisply past Doug Wellen at cover point for four runs, who has fielded very well this innings. What a marvellous catch that is. <laughs> you won't see a better one than that. Johnny Dyson, way down there at third man, has taken a sensational catch to get rid of Alan Knott. Almost took one yesterday to grab Ian Botham's wicket, but couldn't quite hang on to it. And today, that was a great piece of feeling. 356 for eight now. The lead is 457, two wickets in hand. And not is caught Dyson Bowl Lily for 59. Good shot. Beautifully timed in good position. Nicely played straight by Alan, everything right about it. Weight in the right place, head over the ball. Oh, and that's uh, very leisurely, easily pushed off his thighs there by Alan. Uh, coming back for the third. And Whitney there in some doubt which hand to throw at, so he plopped it in the middle of the wicket. And that's it, he squeezed it away through the slips. Don't think they'll worry about a second, they'll be. Uh, gratified enough to take the one up will go the bat there it is 50 runs for John Embury for the first time in a test match oh that's a fine shot only person in danger there was Paul Allett. And uh, what a joy to see a batsman use his feet. A good, lofted, perfectly safe shot. And here he comes, down the wicket. Good foot movement. And a very good strike. Nearly got his partner. Well, Alec's come a long way down, and he couldn't gather the ball. Well, the Australians who've done everything in the field so very brilliantly, yeah, missing a very, very obvious opportunity there, with Bright unable to gather that return. Well, it's 50-50, this. It wasn't a terribly good throw, very difficult for Ray Bright to take. got it at the second attempt Martin Kent 
two good catches he's taken caught one yesterday and has picked up John Embry there to make it 396-49 and he's given it uh, the leg glance before Hundred up for England. Yeah, Hughes catches it. That's the end of the innings, and the Australians bat immediately after lunch. Five hundred and five is the lead for England. Allen not 59, a good innings from John Embry, 57, and uh, Paul Allen again uh, played like a batsman rather than a number 10. The Australian bowlers took some hammer, although their overall figures aren't all that bad. They had to bowl a lot of overs. Alderman, for the first time in his life, I should think, passed the 50 overs in an innings mark and took five wickets. Lily two, Whitney two, and Ray Bright one. And the match situation at lunch. England 231 and 404, Australia 130 and 506 needed to win. I can tell you that that has never been done before. Most of you will know that. 406 before is the best ever. India to beat West Indies, Port of Spain 75-6. 404 for three, that marvellous match at Leeds in 48. And the Australians at Georgetown in the West Indies in 77-78 made 362 for seven. Here's the first over now. It's the second ball and Bob Willis has been given the new ball. He's coming into bowl John Dyson. And that's going to go all the way for four. No third man. So the run's immaterial at this stage. And <laughs> there is Kim Hughes. Reading about what he should have done yesterday, perhaps. He looks very absorbed in it, isn't he? Almost as though he can't bear to look over the top of that paper. Oh, it's got to be quick. There must be a run out. Oh, dear, what a disaster for Australia. Pushed forward there by John Dyson. He sets off straight away and, in fact, is drawn up the wicket a little bit by Graham Wood and is sent back very late. And there wasn't a run there. Gower, one of the quickest people in the game at cover point, and at no stage could he get back to his ground. Well, this again. Well, that was not the sort of shot one would expect uh, Kim Hughes to play at this stage of such a crucial innings. It really was a rather airy-fairy sort of stroke. He's got four runs for it. Yes, bowl short by Bob Willis. Not a good shot by Kim Hughes. He didn't really get behind the ball at all, and it went over the slips for four runs because at this stage of the innings, there's no third man. It was a superb catch by Alan Knott. It really was. Very low, and he made it look so easy. The ball goes down the leg side. Graham Wood gets himself in position to hit the ball, swings at it, and Alan Knott gets across very quickly and catches it two hands. Oh, cracking stroke. Hughes has been uh, notching runs very steadily in that direction. He's had Gower back at third man to save uh, the boundary after it put two away down there, but now he's added a third and taken his side onto the 50 mark. Well, with rings of uh, close catches, 
very few people out. Runs have come at a brisk rate again. 52 for two coming up in the 13th over. Well, with all these runs uh, to play with, of course, they can afford to do without a third man. Nobody back there. And Allert again to Hughes. That's another good-looking shot. Half folly. Lakes down. A clip nicely through mid-wicket. Boycott having a long chase. Going to give it best. And successive boundaries now to the Australian skipper. And again, all the time in the world to hook that away, drop short, and yell up nice into position. He collects four more. Total going on to 65. And yell up now into the 20s. Hughes facing Willis. And he's cracked that through mid wicket before to drop short. Beautiful shot. And uh, surely Bob Willis will see now that this isn't really a wicket for dropping him halfway down. At short, and again it's been put away by Graham Yallop, who's really enjoying this knock now. He's uh, overhauled Kim Hughes, and Kim Hughes, a fine stroke player in his own right. And that's followed it in glorious style. That really is a cracking extra cover drive. Over pitch by Allert and really hammered away in Botham style there. Nicely timed shot from Hughes. Just make two out of it. So those two runs bring up the 100. For Australia, and it's coming remarkably good time. So many adrift, needing over 500 to win, but they've pushed the 100 up in uh, just 18 overs. Quite get that. Got well enough for three runs. Good piece of fielding there, nice piece of throwing from Mike Gadding, and a half century to Graham Yallop. And that's a very good innings. I'd just about give that as a chance, I think. It uh, darted alarmingly off the seam and went very, very quickly past Brealey's right hand. Good piece of bowling, this. Just left Kim Hughes. Edge and just about carried. Very difficult, low down to the right. He's given Hughes out OBW. OBW to both them, and Hughes must have been in line with the stumps there because he was certainly playing a stroke. And there's that dismissal again. The left foot comes forward. Well, there we are. That's. Um, LBW to Ian Botham, 119-4-3. And that's a fine stroke to get Alan Border off the mark. He's batting with a broken hand. Alert to Yallop. What a fine shot. And he helped that from outside the off stump. And Yallop really has uh, looked the part today. Last ball of Ellett's over. Burning to Yallop. Oh, and Chris Tavery, one of the safest slip fielders in the country. Not quite grasping that with his right hand and an escape for Graham Yallop at 89. And a reassuring pat on the back, but a very disappointed Tavry. Yes, 
a ball that moves slightly away from Yallop. He gets the outside edge, and Chris Tavare, moving to his right, fails to hold a catch he should have caught. How often I've seen this before at a time when nothing seems to be going on and the game is quietly going on and the chances offered and how often I've seen it missed. And while Ian Botham gets ready to prepare to bowl again after the drinks interval, that young man behind the stumps there is his elder child, Liam Botham. And those pads come up somewhere near his tummy. As you can see, he's a bit immobile. But any moment now, if he gets the bat in his hand, we may well see the ball flying over into the main arena. Botham to Yellop, still needing three for his hundred. And that could well be it, it is. A hook to square leg gives Graham Yellop his third test hundred against England. A triumph for him after what has been a disappointing tour. He certainly wasn't a sel certain selection for this test match. And Alert to bowl to him. And another splendid stroke straight back down the ground, very hard indeed. And when Graham Yellop drives the ball, he really shows the full face back to the bowler. And another one. Two really resounding straight drives in this over. done him, bowled him, Yallop trying to hit away over mid-wicket and that's a sad loss of concentration after reaching the hundred They've a lack of concentration shot in the last over against Botham and Embry now has broken through, bowling Yallop for 114 198 for four six wickets to go for England Australia still needs 308 Well done, that's well bowled. It looked to me as though it was the curving off spinner. It was out moved in the air. No problem at all. Very great long hop there from uh, Bob Willis and put away in very effective style by Marsh. That's a tremendous yahoo. <laughs> Nearly uh, put his ears back and let fly. Four more. I can't really describe that by saying that's a good shot. A wahoo, I think, is about the only way we can describe it, but it did go along the floor and it did go for four runs. No need to run there. And Borda picking the spot quite delightfully there. And there's another bouncer. And once again, he's got into position well. Hooked it way down the long leg. Four more to Rod Marsh. Another short one, another hook, another four. So Rod Marsh dishing out the treatment now to the short pitch deliveries from Bob Willis. And that's four less they've got to get. Or four fewer, four more to Alan Border. Lovely crisp stroke off the back foot. And that brings up the 50 partnership between Border and Marsh, and they've scored at a very healthy rate and kept Australia 
not only in with a chance of avoiding defeat, but in with a, an outside chance of winning this game and making history by a mile. Slow one, it kept low, but neither of those factors stopped Rodney Marsh bashing it away for four to square leg. And that's well struck by Marsh. But David Gower has put him down. He picked it up, it went all the way down to deep square, and Gower just inside the rope. He may have been unaware where the rope was, I think. And, in fact, it has gone for six, but there's no doubt that it was a chance. He's been given by umpire Ken Palmer, caught at the wicket by Alan Knott or Bob Willis. A big shout from Knott and Willis and the stip fielders, and the six wicket goes down for 296. 210 still needed. For Australia, but England now need only four wickets. Right's not off the mark, and Allard is coming around the wicket to border. Still with three slips and a short four square. Good shot. Right, he's played a couple of those, um, mainly through extra cover. That was uh, square of um, ordinary cover and a glorious stroke. And front foot right to the pitch of the ball there. Any young left-handers watching? That's the way to play it. It's a good shot. There are two marvellous shots in this over from Alan Border. The first one, great cover drive, and then that was just about the classic square cut. And beautifully across, and doesn't he give that a crack? It's over pitched, driven uh, quite respect to Luther and off. No, uh, great power in it, but it'll bring him two runs. Still a long way to go, 184 wanted, four wickets left. 24 Lily to face his first ball. That's confident away, over pitch ball, just about half volley in fact on leg stump. And put away very nicely by Lily. Just about to be pulled up, they'll take three. how half volleys ought to be played. A classic shot, this. It is a half volley length pitched right up outside the off stump, and he plays a fine shot for four runs. I think the great Neil Harvey himself would have been proud with that. And that's very well played indeed by Lily. Hooked along the ground in front of the square. And for the umpteenth time in the last two days, emphasizing the real docility of this pitch, because he had plenty of time to play that shot. Yes, Dennis Lilly doesn't even have to go back to play that shot. He plays it almost where he is. He has plenty of time to play the shot, which shows the pace of the wicket at this stage. So the 350 up. Yeah, 
No mid-off, so it's perfectly safe. Long chase back for David Gar. I think he'll defeat the ball, but they should get three. Lovely shot. Oh, my word, that travel like a bullet. He's hit so many fine square cuts, and I think that's just about the best of them. Look, he gets right across, leans into the ball, gets his head over the ball, and hits it very hard indeed. What a catch! Both of them, what a marvellous catch that was. It was out of his reach, I'll swear. And he took it two hands, it wasn't even a one-hand grab. Nothing wrong with the shot. You can bet your life that Lily labelled it four runs from the moment it left the bat. 373 now for eight. Just two wickets to go for England. And Allett has broken through. Both of them are way on the left-hand side of your picture. That's a good shot from Border. What a nice way to bring up a hundred, and what a good hundred that is. He's let go of the bat with that left hand, and I'm not surprised. He's been in a lot of pain all the way through there, an even hundred for Alan Border, an extraordinary innings of courage and skill with tremendous emphasis on the courage. And he's got to go, LBW, yes. Thought it look, uh, all of them looking a little disappointed, but it looked as though it was going to bowl him until one realised it had hit the pads, and that's usually a pretty good sign that he's right in front. So the ninth Australian but he goes down at 378. They still need 128, and now it's almost over. Oh, no, he's going to get now. He could go all the way for four, which will be what Border doesn't want. And Gara allowing it to run over the rope. So that's four more runs, somewhat unwillingly, garnered by uh, Alan Border. Oh, that's through. And Allett setting after it without any great haste because England are quite prepared to let it go to the boundary. So another boundary for Alan Border, and he's still got one more ball of the over to try and get a single or a three from to keep the strike. But that four brings up the 400 for Australia, and that's a performance of great character when they appear to be very demoralised. Oh, and that was a chance. That was a chance. Uh, Alan not missing Alan Border outside the off stump. It turned just enough, kept a bit low perhaps, and Notty put it down. No question about that. Alan Border went tentatively forward, got an outside edge, and Alan Knott has dropped his first chance of the match. Yes, he's it. He's out, caught it. Uh, forward short leg by Mike Gadding. Bat and pad. Whitney unhappy to go, but England have retained the ashes. Willis taking the final wicket, and Mike Braley's triumph completed. Coming back to Captain England at Headingley, and Ian Botham, who has played such a big part in this match and whose wonderful innings at Headingley, turned the series, which seemed destined certainly to go for. Australia. Alan and Ian Botham showing the true sportsmanship that these Ashes contests are all about and have been 
all these years, more than 100 years, shaking Alan Border by the hand, because Border is perhaps the real hero of this last day, even though he's a hero in defeat. And that's exactly what Alan Border was, a hero in defeat. 123 not out, a fractured third finger on his left hand. He showed tremendous courage and skill and temperament there. And my word, uh, not only can he be proud of that innings, but everyone who knows him can be proud of the fact uh, that they witnessed that here today. 28 there to Dennis Lilly, played very well. And what a blinder of a catch that was from Ian Botham. 402 and the England bowlers, the heroes there for Mike Brealey's team. Bob Willis, three for 96. He came in again there and picked up wickets at the end. Paul Allett, two for 71. Ian Botham, two for 86. John Embry, two for 107. Mike Gatting, no wicket for 13. So the Ashes go to England and the series goes to England. Man of the match? Wherever you look, and I'm not at all concerned what's happened in the previous two test matches, to me, the performance of this match, which was certainly the most spectacular test match 100 I've ever seen, And one which all of those who was privileged was here will never forget. Uh, plus wickets, plus catches, always in the game. Ian Botham is my Cornhill man of the match. So there's been one figure outstanding on this series, which I don't think you need me to say who. And uh, it's Ian, Ian Botham, we know him the man of the match.